Good. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Doing good? All right. Um, if I look a little frantic this morning, I am worked up. Um, I get irritated sometimes. Anybody else? Not even going to lie. Just put it out there. I remember when I first got into ministry, I had somebody tell me, say, Jason, sometimes you just got to fake it. I was like, oh, that's going to be hard for me. I don't fake things well. I mean, I wear my emotions on my sleeve when I'm one of those kind of people. When I'm irritated, you know I'm irritated. When I'm happy, it's easy to tell, right? You don't have to really guess. I'm irritated this morning, <laughs> just am. So be praying that my irritation comes out in holy discontent and in the way God would want it to and not just in anger and frustration. All right, um, let's get to some good stuff before we get into my irritation. Um, <laughs> baptism service, we're, we are still trying to put something together. We're not sure if it's going to be in August. It's looking like it may be September. I'm talking with Dan, um, we're, we're going to try to have it in his property. That's, that's the plan. Um, I'll, I'll share my brainstorm real quick that my wife would probably be like, no, don't do that. We always have a, a picnic, a Labor Day, right? Always get Memorial Day and Labor Day pic- picnics mixed up. Labor Day picnic. Um, out the school street, and I was like, man, wouldn't it be cool, since we're already out there, just to do a baptism service in that pool of the people that are right there that live next door? <laughs> I haven't asked permission. I don't know if that's okay. So if somebody knows the people that live in that house, ask them, because I'm thinking about just stopping by and knocking on the door and say, we're going to be here anyway. Can we use your pool? And Wendy was like, you can't do that. And I'm like, why not? You never know unless you ask. So, um, yeah, that's right. I mean, or we could just ask for forgiveness and do it, and <laughs> when they come out of the house, be like, I, I don't know who the pastor is. Um, so anyway, be, be praying about that. If you need to get baptized, want to get baptized, uh, I don't know, we're just trying to figure out what all the logistics are going to be, but if, if you would like to be baptized, please let me know. Again, we've got a couple of people that have already said something, um, looking for more people. I'd love for this to be a big deal and have tons of people there watching and tons of people getting baptized, and this would be a celebratory event, all right? So uh, be praying about that. Okay, Um, next thing, we will be having a bingo, that's next week, right? Right after church. Now, for all the people that are going, bingo, that's of the devil. Um, It it might be, I don't know, I don't think it is, but, so we're... We're going to do a bingo. It's not for money or anything like that, all right? It's just going to be a fun event for kids to be able to come out, and adults can come out, too. We're going to give away school supplies, okay? Um, If the kid bingos, they get to pick out whatever school supply they want. If an adult bingos, we'll donate whatever school supply they want to whatever school they want. All right, so it's just going to be a fun thing for the kids to be able to do, for us to be able to do. Uh, We're going to have hot dogs and, and refreshments and all that kind of stuff, so you don't have to go anywhere for lunch. All that's going to be free, so... Make plans next week just to hang out afterwards, okay? If you'd like to donate some school supplies or some money for school supplies or whatever, you can see Dawn. I'm sure we can still use some more, right? But it'll be a fun event next week, so make plans to, to hang out and be a part of that, all right? Um, what else? Uh, concession stand. Concession stand. Uh, some of you that have been here the last couple of weeks heard me announce this. Two years ago, we had the opportunity to serve in the concession stand at the high school as just a way to serve our community. We didn't go out there with Bay Country Church t-shirts on. We didn't do any of that kind of stuff. This was not about us and trying to, um, any any agenda of of ours other than to serve the community. Okay, football games, the concession stand is a big deal. It's one of their primary ways that they raise money to buy equipment and and all that kind of stuff. Um, And parents end up working it, is what happens most of the time. So the parents of, of the football team or uh, or some other team end up going in and they, they volunteer and they help out and they end up missing the game or missing their kid's game somewhere else or whatever. So it was just a really, really good thing uh, to be a part of because it really it, it impacted people in a powerful way. People were coming up going, man, thank you so much for doing this. You know, I've done the concession stand 50 times in the last three years and it was so nice to not have to worry about it, just be able to come and enjoy the game and watch my kid play or just walk around and enjoy the football game. Right, so we're going to do that again this year. We're looking, I think it's 15 people a game is what we're looking for. Uh, it was a lot of fun, so if you feel like, oh gosh, I don't want to be a part of that, we had a blast. Is it hard work? Yes, you're out there working the entire time. It's busy, but it, it's still a fun thing to be a part of. Not only did it build camaraderie amongst the people that were working, because it was crazy to see 15 people in there working who in other circumstances may not have been together, you know. Um, and it was something for everybody to do. So you say, well, I don't want to work in a session stand. I'm, I don't even like people. Um, <laughs> We'll put you in the back making pizzas or something. You know, there's, so, there's something for everybody to do there, okay? 
Um, so please consider being a part of that. See Nathan if you'd like more details or you'd like to sign up. We'll have a sign-up sheet next week that'll be outside of, of the doors. Um, we would love to have an overwhelming response, so maybe you don't have to do it every week. Maybe you decide I only want to do it once, or I'm willing to do it every other game or whatever. But please consider being a part of that, because we want to look for more opportunities to reach out into the community to meet people where they are. Okay? Um, it's great to, to have great events and to invite people to church, which we'll probably talk about that a little bit today. Those are great things, but at the end of the day, we are to go with the gospel, right? And you may say, well, how am I sharing the gospel with people at the football game? Just being there showing that you're for the community is a big deal, and it opens up the doors. I remember listening to this guy years ago, and he said, good deeds lead to goodwill, which leads to the good news. And I thought, wow, what a great thing. So just showing some, doing, doing good deeds for people opens up the opportunity to show them that you care, which opens up the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Okay, so these things do have kingdom ramifications to it. All right, so we're going to be looking for more opportunities. And if you know some, if you have, if you, I, I would like to, I'm going to challenge everybody today to do this. Be praying, Lord, what would you have me do? How do I get out into the community? How do I impact people's lives? Come to us with those ideas. I would love to hear them because we want to look for more opportunities, again, to meet people where they are to not constantly be saying, hey, why don't you come and see what we're doing at our church, but rather, hey, how about we take the church to them, okay? So be praying about that. Final thing, youth group. We're, we're going to be starting a youth group, and we had a brainstorming session this past week on what it's going to look like, um, and I'm really, really excited about it. How many people know that the greatest opportunity we have to leverage our resources for the kingdom of God is with young people? All right. Every statistic that you see will say that the chances of a child being a Christian when they're an adult is for them to be a Christian when they're young. Right? To hear about Jesus and accept Jesus when they're young is the greatest chance we have for them to be Christians when they're older. doesn't mean that we will give up on you adults, but the children is the greatest opportunity that we have. And we have, we've been slowly trying to rebuild our youth and kids program. Um, right now, I don't know how many people we have next door, how many kids next door, it must be 15 there, and I don't know how many people are upstairs, all right? So at this point, we're coming close to having as many kids next door and upstairs as we have in here, which is super exciting, because that's the way it used to be at this church, all right? Some of you guys that have been here for a long time can remember the days. I can remember doing kids' church when I was, good grief, I don't know how many years ago that's been, where we would have, we'd have 50 kids, elementary school age, you know? And we want to, we want to do that again, not just so we can boast and say, we got a lot of kids, because we feel like we're impacting them and giving them a firm foundation to live a life that's following Jesus in relationship with Jesus. Okay, so we're, we're trying to rebuild that. So we've been doing that on Sunday mornings, and now we're going to start with our teenagers. And we're going to start on Sunday mornings because that's the easiest time to kind of get things rolling. So starting next week, uh, middle school and high school kids will be upstairs. Right? They're not going to be over there with the little kids anymore. But they're going to go upstairs and have their own time. And we've got several adults that have already said, man, I want to be a part of this. I want to help lead that. So every week they'll go up. And, and what we want is we want it to be a time where the, ki the kids can start to build relationships with each other and build relationships with God, right? Ultimately, that's, that's our goal. And we're gonna, we want it to be a fun experience for them. We want it to be a, a relational experience for them. So we're really, really looking forward to it. Now, I know that may cause some issues for people that go, well, golly day, I've got kids that one's older and one's younger, and they would like to stay together. Uh, we would love to keep them together, but I can tell you the older kids want their own space, right? They want to be with older kids, okay? Um, we're still going to make it super fun for the young kids next door. Um, been talking with Wendy about that. We're kind of brainstorming on how can we make it a, just a, a great experience for the elementary school age kids next door. So if you have ideas or you'd like to be a part of that, let me know. We need workers. We need helpers in that area as well, okay? So in addition to meeting every Sunday, we're also going to do at least a once a month activity with them where we're going to take them somewhere, do something, go to somebody's house, have a bonfire, go bowling, do things like that, okay? And then Beyond that, we would like to find something, maybe it's once a quarter or something like that, where we, where we do something really big with them. You know, we've already started throwing out some ideas, maybe going to the, there's a youth rally in Ocean City that they have every year. Maybe that's something we take the teens to. There's a, a Christian concert in September, and we're looking, okay, maybe that's something we take them to. So we also want to do some things like that as well, and use some technology to make sure we're building relationships. And so super excited about that. So if you have a teenager, man. Please uh, express to them some of these things of, of what we're trying to do. If you know a teenager, maybe you have a teenager in your family, a family member that you're saying, I really wish they would get tapped in and get involved. This is a great opportunity. Okay, so I just want to throw that out there. All right, so I think that's it. I think that's all the announcements. All right, let's jump into, to, into the message. Let's pray. 
Father, we love you and we thank you uh, again for this opportunity to be here this morning. Lord, I pray that uh, you would do your work this morning in our hearts and in our minds at this very moment. Lord, that every single person that's, that's here present in the building and every single person that's watching on Facebook or on YouTube, Lord, that you would right now begin to, to cultivate their minds and their hearts to receive the message that you have for us this morning. And I, Lord, I so desperately want it to be us because I need this as well. Um, I pray that you would guide me this morning in everything that I say. Lord, don't let me cross the line from having this holy discontent where uh, I want to see so many more things happening. Don't let me cross that line into an aggravation and a frustration that, that is a place, coming out of a place of anger um, and that isn't productive. Lord, I, just, I pray that you would give us ears to hear this morning. Help there to be offense where there needs to be offense but help there not to be offense where there doesn't need to be. Lord, there's going to be so many people this morning that, um, that this message isn't really going to be for them. And Lord, you know, so many times those are the people that end up taking it to heart, that get offended, and, and, and it's not for them. So I don't know, I just pray that we hear this this morning the way that we need to hear it, that it lands on each and every one of us individually the way that it needs to. Lord, I pray that we would kind of put our own feelings and emotions and, and all those kinds of things to the side for at least a second to at least examine whether this message is for us and what you would have us to do with it. So um, anyway, Lord, again, just, just pour your grace out on us this morning, each and every one of us, that we would truly hear from you and experience you this morning. So Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we, we finished up our First Corinthians series last week, and um, now, just been praying about where do we go from here? You know, last week I said, I think this is a, this is a crucial time. This is a pivotal time in the history of Bay Country Church. Um, and I think it is in the church in general, but particularly ours. Where do we go from here? You know, what are we going to do? What are we going to look like? Where's God leading us? And I think that is a personal question and a corporate question that we need to be asking. Individually, Lord, what do you want me to do? You know, what's the part that I play? How do you want me to live my life? How do you want me to participate? Right? So individually, we should be asking these kinds of questions. And then I think corporately to say, God, what is our place in our community, right? in, in, in our nation, in our world? What is the part that you want Bay Country Church to play as we come together on a weekly basis? And hopefully a lot more than that, because let me just throw this in there. Uh, we've got to break out of this mentality that church is from 1030 to 12 on Sunday morning. Like, we have, we've, we've got to break free from that, because if that's all it ever is, we are not going to have the impact that we're supposed to have, okay? That we're, just, we're just not. There's no way to do it. I, I get involved with so many discussions that, that border on arguments with other pastors about, well, you guys are doing this, and that's not what the church should look like, and you're doing this, and that's not what... And, and what we end up arguing about is Sunday morning. Well, your service looks like this, so therefore you're not doing church the way that you're supposed to. Let me just say this. There's nobody that's doing church the way they're supposed to if it's just 1030 to 11, 1030 to 12. If that's all it is, you're not being the church, right? You may be meeting in a building. You may be doing some of the aspects of, of church and community, but you're not being the church. Why? Because church is about a group of people that, that have Jesus at the center of their lives, right, that are proclaiming the goodness of who God is and who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, that's investing in the lives of other people, that's getting into the environment around them and impacting that. That's, that's the church. The church is not four walls and a time and a set of programs. It's not what the church is, right? So we've got to break out of this mentality of, of what are we going to do from 1030 to 12? So when you hear me say, what's the church going to look like? If your mind goes right to, well, I think we need to have more singing. I think we need to have more testimonies. I think we're missing the point. Right? Because we're talking about more than just Sunday morning. Sunday morning is a part of it, and we need to constantly be praying, Lord, what do you want this time together to look like? Right? We need to be praying about that and seeking that, but it's got to be so much more than that. Okay? So even this morning, as we begin to talk about personally, what's my place? What's my part? What, do you, what am I supposed to be doing? We need to go beyond Sunday morning. Don't just hear me say Sunday morning. Okay? We're going to talk about workers this morning. Are we workers? Uh, that's sort of the title of the message, the workers are few. And this is something that Jesus said, the workers are few. So when we talk about work, don't just think about Sunday morning. Is Sunday morning a part of it? Do we need workers on Sunday morning? Yes, we need people that are willing to help with our kids, right? We need that. We need people that are talented, that want to that wanna do music and, and help people to engage in corporate worship. We need workers to do that. We need people who are willing to stand up here and speak. We need people who are willing to share testimony. We need people that are willing to do all that stuff. So Sunday morning is a part of it, but that's not all of it. 
What is God leading us to do outside of this time? Okay, so make sure that we're hearing that when we talk about workers. Does that make sense? All right, so we're going we're gonna to be in Matthew, different sections in Matthew today. But we're going to start off with Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Get a drink of water before I get going. All right, so here we go. Verse 35. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Okay, now, so what we want to zone in on this morning is, is what the title of the message was. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Okay, what is Jesus talking about when he says that? What is he talking about when he's talking about the harvest? The harvest is plentiful. What does it mean? In the scripture, you see the word harvest, and it can mean several different things. It can be talking about a literal harvest, you know, literal farming. Um, it can talk about end times, judgment time, when God comes and brings people into the kingdom of God. But in this context, and in so many other contexts, it talks about just simply people being gathered into the kingdom of God. Right? People becoming Christians. People experiencing the kingdom of God, experiencing Jesus. Right? That's what the harvest is. And Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. What he's saying is there are so many people who are ready to come into the kingdom. But what's the problem? The workers are few. There's not enough people to go in and help gather people, to help bring people into the kingdom of God. All right? Now, the first question that we should be asking ourselves right away when we hear that is, is that true today? Right? Jesus is saying this is a problem 2,000 years ago. Is that a problem today? And the answer is always yes. Always yes. I have never run into a pastor yet who says, my goodness, we got too many workers at our church. <laughs> right? I'm having to tell people, no, stop helping. I don't want your help. Never have not once heard that. The complaint is always, I don't have enough people. There's all this opportunity, and I don't have enough people that are willing to help. Right? So then the the follow-up question should immediately come is, am I working? Am I a worker? Am I part of the problem? Right? And that's a hard question that we have to be honest. What am I doing to bring people into the kingdom of God? What am I doing? Am I playing my part? Am I doing what I can? Am I part of the workers or am I not? Okay? So this morning, I want to give us sort of some bad news Right, some hard news, and then we'll talk about some good news. All right? And how many people know you have to have bad news to have good news? Yeah. All right? Too many places you go, that even inside of so, uh, so many churches, if they talk about the good news, the good news, the good news, the good news, but there's never any bad news. And there's got to be bad news, or else the good news isn't good. That makes sense? So we're going to have to hear some bad news this morning before we can appreciate how good the news is. Okay? So Matthew 7, this is something that just, as I read Matthew chapter 9, that really hit me hard um, the past couple of weeks. Verses 13 through 14, another familiar passage. Verse 13, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only, uh, what, few find it. So we have this word few that shows up in both of these passages, all right? And I want us to see that they're connected, right? Jesus says, man, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, right? And then he says, broad is the road that leads to destruction, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This is going to be my contention this morning. The same people that are on that road are the ones working. Got quiet right? The same ones that have found this narrow road are the ones that are working, okay? Now, I want to make sure that we understand the connection and the correlation between these two things, all right? Working does not put us on the road to life, all right? I want to make sure that I say that. Working doesn't put us on the road, right? What puts us on the road to life? Jesus, right? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is the road, but along that road, there's work. All right, how many people give directions according to landmarks? 
right? I don't know the street names of anything. I've lived in Cambridge my whole life, and people say, oh, I live on this street. I'm like, where's that? I have no idea. Well, you go by the old building here, and you turn left and big tree. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about, right? That's the way I give directions, okay? That's the same thing it is with this. Jesus is the road, right? But we should see some landmarks along the way. There should be some work along the way that demonstrates we're on the right path. I don't know what this road is called, but I know I'm on the right path because I see the work. Does that make sense? So the work does not put us in right relationship with the Lord. Right relationship with the Lord leads us to work. Does that make sense? I want to make sure that I say that. So if you're somebody here this morning who says, man, I'm, maybe that's me. I'm not one of the workers. I better start working. What I want to implore you to do is seek Jesus first. Build your relationship with Jesus because that will lead to work. Okay, I've said this a lot. I think I stole this from Matt Chandler, Pastor Matt Chandler. He said this. He said, God is not into behavior modification. He's into heart transformation. So we get that. So often in the church, we want to talk about behavior. Well, you need to stop doing this. Stop using that language. Stop drinking this. Stop smoking this. Stop doing this. Stop doing this. We're into behavior modification rather than heart transformation. Let me lead you to Jesus, right? Let him do some work in your heart, and then he'll take care of the behavior, right? We get it reversed. We want to we get right on people's behavior. You know, you could be a Christian if you just stop doing this. No, you could be a Christian if you put your faith in Jesus, right? He'll lead you to deal with the behaviors and stuff. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so, but I want us to get that these two things go together. They, the work are, are symptoms, right, that show us what the underlying condition of our heart is. So if we want to know, what's my relationship with Jesus like? I don't know. Look at the way that you live. If there is no indication of Jesus in the way that I live my life, I need to question whether there's any indication of Christ in my heart. Does that make sense? And again, this should, this should be really, really, this should be challenging for every single person to stop and look. No, and I want to say this. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus this morning, there's going to be a lot of what I'm talking about this morning. This is not for you. Okay? So please don't leave here and be like, well, golly day, he's really getting on me because I'm not doing anything. All right? Man, if you're just trying to figure it out, you're just like, I'm not even sure about this whole relationship with Jesus. I wouldn't expect there to be uh, tons of, of spiritual fruit, right? We wouldn't expect there to be a whole lot of work because you're still trying to figure out your relationship with Jesus. Okay, but the rest of us that are waving the banner of Christianity, I'm a Christian, all right? Prove it. Prove it, right? Isn't that what James is going to say? James will say, hey, you say you have faith, but let me see your works. Why? Because the works are going to validate your faith. They're going to show me that you do have faith, right? And again, this, this should be for, for all, of, all of us that are saying, man, I'm not, I know I'm not working. I know I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I know I'm not helping to bring people into the kingdom of God. We should stop and go, man, What's my relationship with Jesus like? Do I have one? Right? Now, I want to be careful because I don't want to push it too far because if you're someone that finds yourself in a season of life where you just go, man, right now, my life is chaotic and I'm not doing all the things that I want to do for Jesus, maybe that I've done in the past. I don't want to suggest that you're headed for destruction. Might be, but I'm not going to say that you definitely are. Maybe you're just stalled right now. Right? So maybe you're on this, this road going to life and right, maybe you're just pulled off to the side of the road for a minute. I want to challenge you this morning to get going again. Get going again. Others of us should listen to this and go, crap, I'm on the other road. Right? I'm on the other side of the street. I'm going the other way. And we need to, we need to be aware of that. Okay? Listen, for me to come in and go, you're good. God loves you. You're so good. While you are just speeding 85 on the highway, eight lanes, going to destruction. I'm not doing you any favors. Right? We need to be able to stop and go wave you down and go, wait, 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 you're going the wrong way. You need to be going this way. That's what I pray happens this morning, that this will be a wake-up call. Last week we talked about wake up. We need to be alert. All right, That's, this is a wake-up call, I hope, for so many of us to say, why are we not working? All right, now, two things that I want to talk about today when it comes to working. Well, kind of three. The first one would be this. Um, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So I want to make sure that, I, that, that that doesn't go unnoticed, because if we just jump into work, then we're going to miss the boat, right? Jesus has to, has to be at the heart of everything that we do. Now, that sounds like, uh, I don't want that to be over-spiritual, because Jesus is the answer for everything in church, right? Well, how do I fix this? I'm like, Jesus. Well, what about this? I'm like, Jesus. We know he's the answer, but sometimes people will leave and go, I don't know what that looks like. You can't just tell me that Jesus is the answer to my marriage. How is Jesus the answer to my marriage? 
How is Jesus the answer to my financial situation? How is Jesus a- the answer to my addiction issue? How is Jesus? You know, sometimes we need, to, we need to be a little more clear, and that's what I hope to be this morning. How in the world does Jesus impact our lives so that we become workers in the kingdom? Okay, because he's got to be the motivation. It can't be me. Right? If you just leave here pumped up saying, man, that was a good sermon today. And Jesus, Jason got me messed, mixing up my names. That's terrible, isn't it? Jesus and Jason. Mm. <laughs> sometimes I try to take that role. You got to stop me. Um, but Jesus has got to be at the heart of it. If you just get worked up today and go, you know what, Jason's right, I need to get into stuff. That's not going to last. That's not going to last. Jesus is the only one that will be able to sustain us and on this journey. Okay? So I want to make sure that that's clear. But we want to talk about two different ways that following Jesus um, and having Jesus just be at the core of who we are and what we do should change, change us in a way that leads us to get involved. Okay? So the first one is this. When we go back to Matthew chapter 9. Verse 36, Jesus says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Um, The first way that Jesus should change us, or maybe not the first, but at least one way, um, is Jesus should open our eyes. Right? He should open our eyes to see things as they really are. Does that make sense? Um, I think a big reason why so many people don't get involved Right? They don't see the opportunity to go out and bring people into the kingdom is because they don't open their eyes and see. Right? How aware are we on a daily basis that are, there are people out there who need Jesus? Like seriously, do we think about that every day? How many people would go, man, that's, that's just a common thing in my life. I wake up every day and that's, that's what I focus on. Now, I know there's a couple of people that probably in here that do, that on a regular basis you do that. And you don't want to raise your hands, you don't want to be the only one. You don't want to look like you're super spiritual. Right? But I would say that most of us would say, no, if I'm being honest, that is not the concern of my, my, my life every day. I don't wake up every day. I, I wake up and I jump into my routine. I wake up and I jump into my schedule. I wake up and I start doing the things that I know I have to do. We don't even see the opportunity. We don't even see that there's a harvest out there that's plentiful, right? That's the way Jesus sees. Jesus' first priority is not the daily things of life, not that they're not important, right? But Jesus sees the big picture. He sees more than what is right in front of him. Jesus looks out and he sees the crowd and he has compassion on them. And you'll find this word compassion in the scriptures. It means this deep moving that comes from just your very soul, right? It, it literally means from the bowels. That's what the word, this compassion word means. It comes from the word splagma, right? And, and it means this deep down emotion that just rises up in us. Jesus had this when he looked at people. Do we have that when we look at people? Most of the time, I don't, even, I don't even consider that when I look at people. I'm lucky if I even see the superficial, the outside part of people, because I'm just too busy going places, right? How many people have ever missed, like, your, your wife got a haircut or something, and you don't even notice that he got a haircut? I came home, I don't know what it was, probably a month or so ago, and Paige is, like, right beside me. And I'm like, why is she following me around? And she's twirling her hair. I'm like, what? Give me some space. And she's like, you didn't say anything about my hair. I'm like, oh, that's right, I didn't, right? If I'm not even noticing her hair, do you think that I'm thinking about her relationship with Jesus? You know what I mean? We get so consumed and running around that we barely even see the outside of people, much less be concerned about their inside. Jesus was constantly concerned with people, right? He had this, this passion for him, this love for people that caused him to see people differently. You ever had somebody look at you that way? That they just, you can just tell they love you, right? That, everybody remember the Alexanders that used to come? Everett and Norma, you used to sit right back there. For some reason, man, they just looked at me that way. I don't know what it was, but it was like, uh, uh, they were like proud parents who just looked at me with this, with this love and this concern and this angst for me, you know? Who do you look at that way? Like, there should be great encouragement for every single person in here to know that that's the way Jesus looks at us with great concern for your life, right? God wants the best for us, right? And he has this burning desire for that. So this is what Jesus, when Jesus looked at people, he had this compassion for them, this love. He was deeply moved when he looked at people. We need to have the same look, the same concern for people. How are we going to get that? Only through seeing people through Jesus' eyes, to see the value of people, to see the hurt of people, to see the true need of people. He goes on and says he had compassion on them. Why did he have compassion? Because they were harassed and helpless. 
Now, I love that because these two words, when you look at them in, in the original language, the first one that's translated here as harass, it actually means to, to skin, to fillet. You know, you think about a fish, cleaning a fish and everything. Um, and, and so the deep meaning of this is, man, there are people that have been beat up. They feel like life is just skinning them. You know, they are troubled and, and agitated and frustrated and hurt and feel like they have been beat up and cut up at every turn. You know anybody like that? Maybe there's some people in here that feel that way. There's times where you just get home at the end of the day and you just feel like somebody just beat you up. It's like, man, life is just kicking my butt. Every time I turn around, something else is happening, you know? The other word is translated as helpless. Um, it comes from a word that means to throw. And he's talking about people here that just have th are throwing in a towel. I'm just done. I'm over it. I can't do it anymore. You know any people that are going through marriages like that? It's going to be, I'm done. How many people that, that, are, that are leaving the ministry? Like, it's alarming to see how many people that are in ministry are just rolling out. Why? Because they're throwing in the towel. Because I'm done. I can't do it anymore. You know there's over 800,000 suicides a year worldwide? 50,000 in the United States a year. That's, a, that's alarming, right? Or at least it should be. It doesn't seem to be. Right? I was reading this article the other day. Did you know that there's more suicides in our country than homicides? Like, that's crazy to think, right? Because we're all concerned about homicides. Crime's awful. We've got to do something about crime. The world's going crazy, man. There's just crime everywhere. I'm afraid to leave the house because crime, crime, crime. That's what we hear that stuff all the time. What about the people that are committing suicide at an alarming rate? Why? Because they're throwing in a towel. They said, I, don't, I can't do it anymore. Life is not even worth it. Jesus saw this, do we? Unfortunately, we see it when it's too late most of the time, right? Why? Because we're not paying attention. How many times are there warning signs? Right? How many people have you heard say that? Why didn't I see the signs? Because we're not watching. We're not looking. We're not seeing through the same eyes that Jesus saw with. Jesus saw that. Jesus saw the people that were giving up. Jesus saw the people that had thrown in the towel. This is why we constantly see Jesus associating with these people, right? The people that are on the side of the road with, with leprosy. People that everybody else has just forgot about. The people that are just laying there basically waiting to die at the pool of Bethesda. We see this time and time again, these people that have just given up hope, they've thrown in a towel. No one else sees them. They're invisible in our society. But Jesus sees them. We need to see them. If we don't see people, we're never going to get involved. Right? If we don't open our eyes and look and see that there's a whole world out there that needs Jesus. Right? They're searching for all kinds of stuff. They're looking for meaning. They're looking for fulfillment. They're looking for answers in all kinds of places. And we have them. And what are we doing with it? We meet together on Sunday mornings. Some of us. Right? We've got to see people through the eyes of Jesus. John 4, 28-38. We talked about this story. I don't know if it was last week or the week before. The woman at the well. Jesus is having this conversation with a woman at the well that... Again, she was, a, she was a nobody. She was an outcast. You know, I can just picture this woman at the well, just tired, beat down, sick of life, saying, I can't find meaning, I can't find answers, I'm being beat up at every turn, I just want to throw in a towel. And Jesus shows up. Right? Jesus sees her when no one else does. So he tells her about this living water that he wants to give her. Right, And then this whole conversation where she's talking about physical water and he's talking about spiritual water. And this is going to be a theme for the next couple of minutes as we talk. We're going to constantly see this. that our, Can we see beyond what we see with our eyes? I was telling Nathan this. We got any uh, Lion King fans? Anybody seen the Lion King? How about the Lion King one and a half? Right? Did you even know there's a Lion King one and a half? There is. Well, there's a scene in there where Timon, he's, he's the meerkat, right? Um, he's, he's talking with Rafiki, the monkey, and, and Timon's all worked up, and Rafiki's like, what's going on? What's wrong with you? And he's like, I'm, I'm trying to find a place where, uh, where there's no worry, where there's no concern, a good place, a quiet place, a place where I can, where I can live and not be in fear, all these kinds of things. And he's like, oh, you're seeking Akuna Matata, right? We all that know, we know that from part one. Well, this is a conversation, I guess, that took place before that. He's like, you're seeking Akuna Matata. He's like, yeah, how do I find that place? And this is Rafiki's advice, and it always stuck with me. He said, look beyond what you see. Look beyond what you see. How many of us do that? How often do we look beyond the things that we immediately see with our eyes? Because see, in the Bible, there's two ways to see things. There's seeing with your eyes physically. But then there's a seeing that goes beyond that. It goes with an understanding, a perceiving, and understanding what's really going on here. 
You know, do we do that? Jesus is constantly saying, hey, stop looking at the things right in front of you. Stop looking at the physical things. See the spiritual landscape. See what's really going on in people. Don't just see them for what they're doing and, and, and their exterior things, but see them for who they are. See their hurt. See their pain. See their hope. See their dreams. Right? Look beyond what you see with your eyes. All right? So John 4, 28 through 28. So this is after Jesus has this encounter with this woman. Right? She leaves the well, drops her jar, and runs back to the town. It says, in leaving her jar, the woman kept the woman went back to the, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. Now, if you don't know the whole story, the rabbi, uh, the disciples have left, right? Jesus goes to this well and he's sitting there talking to this woman. All the disciples leave to go find a town so they can get some food to come back so all of them can have some have some lunch. Okay? So the story is. Jesus talks with this woman, has this profound impact on her. She gets up, rolls out, leaves her water jug, the thing that she came to get, the thing she came to find refreshment in. She didn't find it in that anymore. She's going to find it in Jesus. She runs back to the town to tell them about Jesus. The disciples come rolling back in, right? And they've come with her food. And this is what he say. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, because someone had brought him food. And I love that. I love that, because this is one of those times where I want to look at the disciples and go, y'all are so dumb. You're so dumb, right? They're, they're talking about food. Hey, Jesus, we have some food. And Jesus is like, man, I already ate. I already had something. I got food that you don't know anything about. And they're like, did somebody else bring him some food? Right? And we're reading the story. We're like, y'all are so dumb. Don't we do the same thing? Don't we get focused on the physical things and the material things and God's going, hold on, this isn't about the physical stuff. I'm trying to teach you something spiritual. I'm trying to do something with your faith. Get beyond your circumstance. Right? So before we shake our heads too much at the disciples, we need to understand we're, the, we're them. Right? He says, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Okay? So Jesus says, look, we need to get beyond the everyday living. Right? The everyday things of life should not be what sustains us. What should sustain us is doing the things that God has given us to do, which is what? Reap a harvest. Okay? That's part of what God has given us to do. He says, don't you have a saying, uh, it's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Okay, so now there's some, a little bit of disagreement in, between experts that read this passage and try to figure out exactly what's going on here. All right? Jesus says... Um, don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? You'll see it's in quotes in this. So the NIV is, is treating this like this is a saying that's already out there. Some experts think that's what it is, that there's, this is part of some proverb that was common during the time, and it was sort of a proverb encouraging people to be patient, right? The harvest is still four months away. Be patient, okay? And Jesus is saying, you guys say that, but what I'm telling you is the time for patience is over. The time is to act. It's time to move. Look at the harvest. It's time for us to get moving, not waiting. How many of us act that way when it comes to, to people that we know, people that we love? Reaching out to them and telling them about Jesus, we're like, well, no, I just don't think they're ready. I just don't, I just, I just don't think they're ready. I just don't think this, it's the right time yet, right? Jesus is going, no, 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 now is the time. Now is the time. The harvest is right. All right, so you have some people who see it that way, that this is a proverb um, that's being said. Other people say, no, this, this is more of a literal thing that Jesus is saying, hey, this is what you guys are saying. You're looking around and you're saying it's still four months to the harvest. So it really is that time of year where it's still four months before they harvest the, the literal wheat, the literal grain, right? And Jesus is saying, open your eyes, though, because what I want you to see is that the spiritual harvest is ready now. Okay, so when they, and I love the fact that Jesus teaches on what you see. Jesus is constantly pointing, going, that right there, that's like the kingdom of God. This thing that you do every day, that's like the kingdom of God. I love the way that he teaches that way. So, right, so Jesus is saying, hey, look around. Look at, look at the fields. You may say, hey, there's still four months away, but there's another harvest. If you will look beyond what you see, you will see that it's ripe. Now, what's going on physically? Again, picture the scriptures. Don't just read them. Picture what's really going on. All right, so what do we read in the beginning? This woman runs back to the town, tells the people about Jesus, and what do the people do? Go to see Jesus. Got all these people that are coming to Jesus, and going, Jesus is going, do you see what's happening? Do you see the harvest? Forget the grain, forget the wheat over there. Do you see the harvest that's coming? They're ready. Okay, I love that. We can do the same thing. We need to look around. Look at the people God has put around you. Do you recognize that the harvest, it's time. 
It's time to reap the harvest. There are people who are ready to come into the kingdom. Are we ready to help them? Okay? Let's keep reading. Verse 36. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap. That's the part I want us to hear in this last couple of verses. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. I'm not going to get into everything that that means. It just means that Jesus, the prophets, John the Baptist, other people have been laying the groundwork, and now you're going to come in, you're going to reap this harvest that other people have planted and watered and done all that stuff. Okay? Um, we're put in the same position. There are times where we are called to plant the seed. There are people that don't know anything about Jesus, never heard about Jesus, and, and God wants us to plant the seeds. Talk about Jesus. Talk about the good news. Right? There's other people that have heard it, but they need some cultivating. They need some watering. They need somebody to, to invest in them a little bit. There's other people that, man, they've heard about it. They are ready to accept them. They just need someone that will gather them together. They need somebody to talk about exactly what it means to make the decision to follow Jesus. I'm sure we can think of people in our lives that, are, that run that whole gamut, can't we? You know, there's people that God has surrounded you with that know nothing about the gospel. Plant the seed. There's people that know a little bit, and maybe there's opportunity for conversation. Pour into their lives. What are that? And there's other people that are ready that just need the invitation. Man, do you want to accept Jesus? Wherever those people are, we're called to be a part of that, okay? We're called to be a part of the reaping process, all right? So that's the first thing. Are we willing to open our eyes and see beyond what we see every day, right? To look beyond what we see, to see the true need, to see people as they truly are, right? To see people like Jesus does. If we don't, we will never feel a compulsion to get involved, Okay? And last week, we talked about the things we need to be alert for, reasons why we don't produce fruit, the reason why we don't invest in people's lives. Well, some, of it, some of the thing is just a hardness of heart, right? There are certain things that we don't even flinch about anymore, right? That we, you watch the news now. How many people are, like, really stirred by the news? I don't mean just angered, but I mean stirred in a way that you're like, golly day, where are we at as a country, you know? Most of the time, you just watch the news, and it's like, this person got shot. Oh, another one? We're not even impacted, right? Our hearts have just become hardened to it. It doesn't even penetrate our heart. It doesn't even impact us, right? There's other, others of us that are just going through tough times that can't even see anybody else because of the struggles that we're going through, right? There's other people we look and we say, man, I, I'm not going to get involved in any of that stuff because it's a mess. It's going to be a nightmare, so I'm going to stay out of it. There's others that don't see the need because we're so busy with everything else, you know, and these are the, these are the four soils we talked about last week. We just can't get involved because I got my own stuff. I'm, I'm, being, I'm drowning in my own stuff. I can't get involved in other people's lives. I, I don't even see it, right? We've got to be like Jesus. We've got to see people like, like he did, right? Or we're never going to be uh, motivated to get involved. All right, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second one is this, and, and this is sort of the, the really hopefully encouraging positive news because I, I think there's also a reason why people don't get involved. They see the need, but they feel like, what can I do? Right? Would that be anybody in here that would say, man, I know society is jacked up. I know they need Jesus, but I don't know what I can do. I mean, who am I? How can I possibly help with, with the suicide rate? How can I possibly help with, with the number of abortions? that are How can I help with this situation that's going on with, with masks and corona? How can I help bring people into the kingdom of God? I'm not sure what I can do. I don't know what part I can play. I pray that what we hear this morning through the passage we're getting ready to see is that there's a part for all of us to play if we're willing. We can, we can do tremendous things or, or, or more accurately God can do tremendous things through us if we will allow him to do it. Does that make sense? All right, so Matthew 14, 13 through 21. Start with verse 13. It says this. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them. Again, if we don't have eyes to see the need, we probably won't get involved, all right? He had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. All right, now this is a good thing for the disciples, right? They look and they see the need of people. They say, man, Jesus is getting late. People have been here all day. Okay, you've been, you've been preaching, you've been healing people all day. You need to send the people away so they have time to get home before it gets dark so that they can get something to eat, right? That's a, that's a big concern. We should be concerned with people's physical needs, okay? So don't, 
hear me say that physical needs don't matter. We should be involved in meeting people's physical needs. All right? Verse 17, uh, verse 16. Um, Jesus replied, they do not need to go, go away. You give them something to eat. Now, if you, if you know the story, you know how many people are there. Right? At the end, we're going to read. It's over 5,000. That's just the men. It's not counting the women and the children. So the Lord only knows how many people were, were here listening to Jesus. Imagine having that kind of service. Right? Like, I, I long to see this place packed. Right? Just packed. So to the point that we can't even fit another person in here. Um, okay, let me express a little more irritation real quick. Um, yesterday, I'm, I'm riding through town, and, and I go by RAR. Right? And there are people lined around the corner to get into RAR. I don't know whether they had like a new release of, of, a, of a new beer. Or I don't know what, what it was. But all I know is people come and they wait to get in there. Hours. I mean, they got their lawn chairs and they got coolers. And I'm like, you bring a cooler, you're planning on being somewhere for a while, right? They, I mean, they are, they are there in the cold. It doesn't matter. They are lined up, ready to get in there. And we've got empty seats. Hold on. They got a new beer flavor. We got Jesus. Right? I mean, they got a new product. We've got life in here. We have healing in here. We have fulfillment. We have relationship. We, we, we have all of these things here, and yet we have empty seats, and they got a line. Why is that? Why is that? Now, I think the easy thing for us to do as Christians is to go, well, that's because they're lost. They're messed up. They got their priorities mixed up, right? I don't think we can put the blame on them. Why? Because Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. He didn't put it on them. He didn't say, hey, there is no harvest. Sorry, guys. That's not what he said. He said it's plentiful. They're not the problem, right? They're waiting to come into the kingdom of God. They're ripe to come into the kingdom of God. Where's the problem? on us. So there's something about us that is causing people not to come in. It's not their fault. It's our fault. Right? So that was just something that yesterday I was like, why is that? I remember going to a church years ago in, in Virginia. Uh, I think it was McLean Bible Church. And um, they had this great big sanctuary to held on them, thousands and thousands of people. But they kept the doors locked to get into the sanctuary until a certain time. And right, I was irritated initially. I was like, I'm going to find my seat. Making me stand out here, wait, get in here. What kind of crap is this? Um, but then the more I stood there, I thought, but it's something awesome about this, that there was this excitement building of people going, I want to get in here to experience what God's going to do. Why do we not have that kind of excitement for people to get into the church? Because I don't think there's that much different going on here than is going on out there. Does that make sense? If people look in and go, well, hold on, you're, you, you do the same things that everybody else does. You're just as miserable as everybody else. You're just as angry and backstabbing and gossip just as much as everybody else. You live the same lifestyle as everybody else. What in the world are they drawn to? Right? I mean, if, 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 if they opened up some place uptown and they said, come experience nothing, <laughs> we wouldn't, you wouldn't go, right? I mean, that wouldn't be exciting if it was like, hey, just come and sit and do what you normally do. Why would I go? And then you want me to work? That doesn't make any sense. It has to be something that's different. Are we different? Are we offering something? I mean, we should be. I think that's why Jesus is, is, has thousands of people that are following him around. And we look and we say, well, that was Jesus. Why aren't we supposed to be like Jesus? Like, shouldn't people just be drawn to us? Shouldn't there be something about the way that we live that causes people to go, what's going on over there? And check that. What, what is it about that guy? What's going on with that guy? How come people flock to that guy? Right? It's awesome to see people that are, that are really Christians and exude Jesus because typically they got people around them. You ever notice that? Now, see, I get myself in trouble when I say stuff without thinking. Um, but it's true. There's people that are, that are in here that you will always see people around them talking. Why? Because they're people magnets. There's something about them. You know, now is it always Jesus? No, sometimes they're just charismatic and funny and people just really like them. But I don't know, there's just something about, about us that should be 
a magnet for people. Now, now are we going to face persecution? Are there going to be people that don't like us because of the message? Yes, the gospel carries an offense. Why? Because there's bad news that people have to understand first before they can get the good news. So yes, there's going to be offense. There's going to be some people that are going to be repelled by us. But generally what I find in, in the world today, in the church today, is people aren't repelled by Jesus. I got a book in my office that I need to go back and, and reread and said they like Jesus but not the church. Well, why is that? Because unfortunately, people don't get enough of Jesus in the church. They get a lot of us, right? They get, and, and listen, we need to be able to come here and have our hang-ups and our, you know, we need to be able to express the way that we're jacked up, but we need to be honest about that. And we need to look to Jesus to help us. So it's, I'm not saying we need to be perfect in here or whatever, but there should be something about the way that we live our lives that draws people. Jesus was like that. Everywhere Jesus went, he, a crowd developed. Why? Because, man, Jesus saw the need of people, and he filled the needs. Right? Jesus saw what people needed, so Jesus had the words of encouragement. Jesus preached the message of hope. Jesus preached the message of salvation. People, Jesus healed people physically. Jesus did all these things to meet people's needs. Why? Because he had compassion for them. Okay? We need to be the same way. This place should be packed. Right? It really should. It should be packed. It, it is an embarrassment to me that I, am, I have invited more people to play pickleball in the last three months than I have to church. That's, that's horrible. Like right now, you should be questioning whether you should be here. <laughs> You're going, my pastor sucks. I need to go somewhere else. But that's the, that's the truth. As I think back, that's, that is the truth. I have invited more people and told more people about pickleball than I have about Jesus in the last three months. Why? This is terrible to say. I guess I'm more excited about pickleball on a daily basis than I am about Jesus. Right? I mean, listen, does anybody have to pry things that you're excited about out of you? Right? Typically they don't. Right? Ask me about one of my kids. I'm going to tell you in a minute. Right? I'm not like, well, I don't know. What is there to say? No, no, no. Let me tell you what my daughter's doing, man. She's going to school. She's going, taking these classes. She wants to be a PA. She's getting ready to start the phlebotomy school. She's doing, what, what about your son, man? He's thinking about playing travel baseball. All of a sudden he's got excited about baseball. He's met these guys that he really likes. Built relationships. He made switch schools. He maybe go to North or Chester. We're trying to figure all that. I've got no problem talking about my kids. Why? I'm passionate about it. Ask me about pickleball. I can tell you about pickleball, boy. I tell you how to play and how fun it is, how great the people are. You don't, have to, you don't have to pry that out of me. We talk about the things that we're excited about. How often do you talk about Jesus? Look, the easiest thing in the world should be to invite somebody to something you're excited about. If there's something going on here that you are so excited about that you go, my goodness, you've got to come listen to this guy talk about Jesus. You have got to see these people that just love Jesus. You have got to come experience what it's like to be in community with people who love each other and love Jesus. Whatever you're excited about, this should be easy to invite them. Right? How many people have you invited to church? Like That should be the easiest part of Christianity, don't you think? Right, because that's taking a lot of responsibility off of you. You don't even have to tell them about Jesus. You have to just simply say, hey, why don't you come with me Sunday? We would do it about a restaurant that just opened up we were excited about, wouldn't we? So if we were excited about what's going on at church, wouldn't it be the easiest thing in the world just to simply say, hey, I don't have to tell them about Jesus. I'll let Jason do it on Sunday. Now, I'm not saying do that because we should be telling people about <laughs> Jesus. But I'm saying that is sort of the minimum amount of work, right? To at least tell people, hey, you should go, go to church with me on Sunday. Like, again, there's no reason why this place should not be packed. How many people here know somebody that needs Jesus? Every one of us knows somebody, right? How many people here know at least one person that you could say, I'm going to invite to church next week? Do you have one person that you could do that with? Look around. How many empty seats would we have if every single person in here just brought one? Just one. We would be packed. We would have to try to figure out where are we going to put more seats? How are we going to go to another service? Okay, and again, this isn't about attendance, it's not about the numbers. Okay, I used to care about the numbers a whole lot, I'm telling you. When I came in here, we used to have, we'd have 150 people in this place sometimes, right? Just in this room, not counting next door and upstairs. It, was, it would be packed, right? When we started dropping down to around 100, I was going, we might as well close up shop, right? That's how I thought. Why? Because it was, it was about numbers. But then I started to realize, why is this so important? Why are the numbers so important? Because numbers represent people, Represent souls, represent people who have emotions and, and heartaches and hurts and pains that need Jesus. Okay, so it's not about, so I can brag to my, my pastor friends, how many did you have this week? I had 150. I like doing that, but that's not what it's all about, I hope. I hope it goes beyond that. 
I hope is, man, we had 150 people there that are hearing about Jesus, that are living life together, that are investing in one another's lives. That's what I would love to be able to tell people, you know? And, and again, I'm happy to say that with whatever we have here. We might have 50 in here today, right? I want to be able to say that. I want to be able to say, man, you need to come check out our church because we have people that just love God and love each other. I want you to be a part of it. I want to be able to tell people, hey, man, you're hurting, you're ready to throw in the towel. Man, come to a place where you're going to be loved, where you're going to be accepted, where people, where people care about you. Like, that's the kind of church that I want us to be. I want us to be a church that comes together and celebrates who Jesus is, right, and gets excited about Jesus. I'm starting to realize that about music. I love music, and the minute we stopped doing live music up here, I was like, this stinks, right? We need to shut it down. We shouldn't even meet, right? Again, because music was that important to me, now I'm realizing it's not the music, it's the worship, right? It's to be able to get together and corporately with one voice sing to God who has done tremendous things for us. I miss that. Right? I want people to come. I want to be able to invite people to come, not just to hear how talented our, our praise team is, but I want to invite people to come and engage in worship, to see a group of people who love Jesus enough that they just want to sing his praises. Right? That's why I want a worship team now. It's not so we can be one of the cool churches and have a cool worship team and have an entertaining thing. It's so we can come together and praise and worship God through song. Because there's something powerful about the worship experience, right, corporately. I can worship in my car all day long and love to do that, right? I love to turn on worship music at home while I'm doing the dishes and other stuff like that. I love that, but there's something that's powerful about a corporate worship experience, okay? And, and, and Dawn and I were talking about that first thing this morning, about, about the power of us, you know? That's such a more powerful word than me, you know? We, we want to be a, power, a powerful body of Christ, a strong body of Christ, right? We don't want to be see a, a weak body that's ineffective and not powerful and not able to affect change and do things in our community. Well, how do we do that? Part of that is coming together as one and strengthening one another, right? So that's why it's so important to be here. I see people all the time, and they're like, you know, well, I couldn't make it to church. And I'm like, look, 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 my first concern is for you. Like, I can't tell you how many people that I'm like, hey, missed you this week. How you doing? Like, oh, I would have been there. And it's like, wait, 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 before we get into the church attendance, how are you? I had a conversation with a guy like three weeks ago where I did that. I called him, man, I haven't seen you in the last couple weeks. How, how you been doing? Well, I did this and this, but I'll, I'll be back. Well, that's cool, but how you been? Well, I've been doing this and this, but I'll be back next week. No, no, no. How have you been? I'm concerned about you, not just you filling a seat. Okay? And, and for all the people that have missed, because I've texted some people recently, Man, I apologize. I need to call. I need to do a better job of that because sometimes I, I feel like it comes across that way. Hey, just I just want you to be there. And the fact that you weren't there, I'm checking up on you. I really do care about where, where you've been and how you've been. Like, that's my, that's my biggest thing, right? So as an individual. But I'm constantly encouraging people to come to church not just to fill a seat, but to be a part of the corporate body, right? To come together, to be a part of a group. There should be great power in that. There's not much power in coming and sitting in a seat. Okay, I've said that before. No one's spiritual gift is sitting and doing nothing. It's not in the scriptures. It's not one of the spiritual gifts, right? There's something that's powerful when you come and you get involved. Man, I'm, man, I'm getting way off track here. Good grief. Um, I'm, in, I'm in the weeds a little bit. Um, Jimmy Adams, is he here today? No, he's not here. Good, so I can talk about him. Um, Jimmy Adams came, man, and you know how Jimmy Adams got involved in church? Making sweet potato biscuits. What were we, I don't even know what you were raising money for at that point. Carrie Ann was doing a fundraiser, right? Yes, I mean, at that point, Carrie Ann was doing a ministry where they were uh, ministering to orphans in Uganda, and they were selling sweet potato biscuits to raise money or whatever. Jimmy Adams is like, I just want to get involved. I'll make some sweet potato biscuits. It's like, man, why can't we all do that? How many people here can't make sweet potato biscuits? Maybe not on your own. Right? But somebody that knows how to can show you how to make some sweet potato biscuits. Right? There's so many ways to get involved. There's so many ways to work. All right? We've got to stop thinking of, of the only way that I can work is to serve in these three areas. No, no, no. There's lots of areas to serve. There's lots of areas to work. There's lots of areas to impact people. The question is, are we willing? Okay, so let's transition back into this. All right. So, Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. I love that. Imagine that. Imagine if you're the disciples and, and Jesus is, has just told you, you feed five, six, seven thousand, eight thousand people. You feed them. What do you think the response is by the disciples? They look and they see the need. They're like, 
How in the world are we going to do that? Seriously, like, Jesus, how can we do that? If we took all the money we had, it would cost this much money to feed these people. Is that what we're supposed to do? How can we possibly meet the need? What's Jesus say? Now, it's not in, in this passage right here, but in, in another scripture. Um, Jesus says, what do you have? And I love that question. What do you have? What do you have to give this morning? What do you have to contribute? What is your part in the body? Right? Jesus says, what do you have? And I love this answer. And, and, I, and part that I hate about the scripture and see this leaves too much room for my imagination to fill in blanks and try to figure out what was the tone. And, you know, so I, I, I read a lot of sarcasm and stuff into stories that probably don't have any, but that's just my sickness. Um, what's their answer? You give them something to eat. Verse 17, Jesus is like, what do, you, what, do you have, what do you have? What can we give them? We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. I don't know how they said that, but I have to imagine they're like, here you go, Jesus, there's five loaves of bread and two fish. That's what we got. Right? What do you want us to do? Right? What do you want us to do? What does Jesus say? Oh, well, that's, yeah, you're right. That's not enough. Just send them home then. Is that what he says? Verse 18, bring them here to me. I love that. What do you have? Bring it to me. Jesus doesn't say, hey, you have anything big to offer? If you do, bring that to me. And say, oh, that's all you've got, that little thing? That's not worth anything. No, 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 bring it to me. Bring it to me. What do you have to contribute? If you will give it to Jesus, he will do something awesome with it. All right? He says, bring them here to me. He said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. I love that. Everybody ate everything that they wanted and they had leftovers. They had to-go bags. I love that. With five loaves and two fish. That's what Jesus does when we give him what we have. So the question isn't necessarily what do we have. The big question is are we willing to give it? What are you willing to give? Right? Are you willing to say, okay, Lord, I can do this. This is what I've got. Right? I've got this amount of time. I'll give it. I've got this amount of money. I'll give it. I've got this talent. I'll give it. I have this ability. I'll give it. Are you willing to give it? If so, Jesus will do tremendous things with it. Like, this should be great encouragement for us, because when we stop and we go, the world's a mess. I don't know what to do. What can I contribute? What can, uh, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing, no way I can help. Sure there is. You can make all the difference in the world to a person, right? And it doesn't it take something big. It can be something small. How many people have had their day just brightened by a smile? Anybody here got a smile? Some of you, I wonder, right? Are you willing to give it? You willing to see somebody and realize that, hey, that's a person that may be having a rough day? Are you willing to say, hey, good to see you. How you doing? Are you willing to do something that simple? That can mean all the difference in the world. Again, we have no idea what people are facing. We have no idea what their struggle is. For somebody to know that somebody cares could make all the difference in the world literally from them going home and throwing it all away and saying, I'm done, I give up. That's all it may take is one word of encouragement. I'm glad to see you today. And listen, don't, we can't be fooled and think that's nobody here. Right? I know we're all in church and everybody's got it together and everybody's good. Right? How you doing? Good. Praise God. Blessed. Highly favored. Right? I know we're in church, so that's the answer we got to give. Right? We need, to, we need to forget all that. That's crap. There's people in here right now that are struggling. There are people right now that are sitting in here that feel like I've been beat up. Life has beat me up. I just, I don't even know where to go. There are people who are sitting here right now who are saying, I just want to throw in a towel. I can't do it anymore. I can't go one more day in this marriage. I can't go one more day on this job. I can't go one more day with this physical pain. I can't go one more day. And they're ready to throw in a towel. And you may be the person who says, I'm glad you're here. You know how much I look forward to seeing you every day. And that could be the one thing that changes their mind this very minute. Are we willing to do it? Or are we going to be so consumed with what's going on in our own personal world that we're not even going to see them. I mean, just imagine how that would change if every single person that you looked at, every single person that you ran into, if I wanted into Frank, man, I wonder what's going on in his life. He might be struggling right now. Maybe I'm the encouragement he needs. Maybe I've got something he needs today. How would that change our interactions? 
I mean, again, I, just, I, I think these are so simple, and I say this all the time, that this would change our lives if we actually did it, and I truly mean it. How would this change our lives if we saw people the way Jesus does? Right? And then to realize we have something to give. We have something to offer every single day. Listen to this promise. I'm going to close on this. This is it. Psalm 126, 5 and 6. It says, Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. I love that. Those who sow, what does it mean to sow? To invest, to plant seeds, right? So those that invest in other people's lives with tears in their eyes, understanding that people are hurting and lost and need Jesus, right? Those people that do that will reap. What does it mean to reap? To gather, right? To see fruit, to gather in fruit. They will reap with joy, songs of joy. Verse 6, those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return. And I love the word will in this. Will, there's a promise in this that I just love, right? Will, he doesn't say might, could, possibly, they will. Those, those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. What's a sheave? A big bundle of, of wheat or grain, right? It's bundled together and carrying. So imagine that. Those who have this concern, who go out weeping, who see the needs of people, who see that the harvest is ripe, how will they return? With sheaves. Right? I love that. The scriptures say, hey, God's word will not come back void. I love that. It will have an impact. It will have a result. If we will go out with compassion for people, concern for people, understanding that people need what we have, we will reap a great harvest. Do we believe that? Do we believe that people out there need Jesus? Yes. yes. Are we going to act like that? Yes. Do we believe we have something to offer them? Yes. Right? Are we going to live our lives that way? We have a tremendous promise here. Do we want to see people coming into the kingdom of God, living in the peace and the joy and the comfort and the love that Jesus provides in our lives? Yes. If the answer is yes, we have something to give. We have something to give. Are we going to give it? Are we willing to sow right, with tears of joy that we, can, that we can reap with great joy? Let's pray. Father, again, I pray that this is not just a stirring message, that it's not one that just makes us think, it's not one that just kind of stirs our emotions for a day or whatever, but that it truly um, penetrates deep down in our hearts and minds and transforms the way that we see transforms the way that we live. But I think it is uh, detrimental to you, it's detrimental to the church, when we wave the flag of Christianity and have none of the fruit to demonstrate it. Lord, I pray that we would ask for forgiveness for that, that we would see when we have settled for church attendance or just programs or just sitting and listening just sitting and doing nothing. I pray that we would ask for forgiveness because that is not what any of us are called to do. And Lord, again, I pray that we hear this, that people hear this the way that they should. There are people who are just starting to figure this stuff out, who are still seeking. And for, the, for them to come and just hear and listen and, and right now and be fed, that's what they need. So this is, I'm not talking to them. So please, Lord, please don't allow offense to creep in where it's, not, where it's not intended and where it's not needed. But for the rest of us, Lord, maybe that have been Christians for a long time. That, Lord, can't, can't even name the last time that we told somebody about Jesus. Can't name the last time that we served somebody in some capacity at the church. They can't even remember the last time that they invited somebody to church. But I pray that we would ask for forgiveness for that. Because that, that, that is not traveling on the road that you've laid before us. Lord, you've called us to be workers in your kingdom. You've called us to participate in gathering in a harvest and bringing people into the kingdom. Help us to have that as our focus. Help us to not be blinded by the things of this world that are immediately in front of us, the demands of our schedule, the demands of physical and material things. Help us to see beyond that stuff into the real need that people have, which is, the, which is you. People are hurting. This world is broken. Lord, there are people that, that are desperate to find hope, to find meaning uh, in their lives. And we have it. We have it. Lord, the quote that I've got written on my desk, one of them, Lord, that just says, how many people's miracles are, are, are stuck in a box called the church? There are people out there that, that need you. 
that need encouragement, that need hope, well, we've been called to give it. We've been called to play a part, and not just the super spiritual people, not just the people that have certain skills that can preach or sing. And not, Each and every one of us has something to give. Lord, I'm sure when that boy brought his lunch that day, he didn't know that he'd be feeding thousands of people with it. But that could be done through you. Same thing is true with us, Lord. We may not have a whole lot that we feel like we can give, but when we give it to you willingly, you multiply it. You make it more than enough. And you've given us this promise that we will see a result, that, when we, that we will reap what we sow. If we're willing to sow generously, we will reap generously. So help us to do that. So again, Lord, we love you this morning and thank you for this message. I pray that it has an impact on us, that it changes the way that we live our lives. There's a world out there dependent on it. They're dependent on it. So help us to follow you and see people as you do. So Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.